Our next speaker this morning is uh, Jeff Litke. Jeff has uh, been here with us in the uh, Spring Church Christ uh, for quite a while, though he's left and come back, and we certainly welcome him back. Jeff is the father of three daughters, the three beautiful daughters, I might add, Lorelai, Liliana, and Macaria. And uh, he is a 2001 graduate of the, uh, what started out, I think you started, it was the Houston College Bible when you started, and it was the Spring Bible Institute when you left, and of course now it's called TBI, or Truth Bible Institute, so Jeff, we ought to list all three of those there, I guess. But um, Jeff has done local preaching in New Mexico and Texas. He now, again, has moved back here. He lives there in the Woodlands, and he's a member here at the Spring Church of Christ. And uh, more importantly, he is uh, a, uh, a speaker of the truth, as God would have him speak it. He's my brother, and he's my dear friend. That's the way I count him. Jeff, come speak to us. First off, I'd like to say thank you to the elders for having these lectures, allowing me the privilege of being here to speak with you, or to speak to you. Thankful for David and his work and preaching all the time and all the things that he does and putting together this lecture and everyone who worked to make it happen and especially just want to say uh, everyone ought to thank Sonia for putting up with all of us speakers and not just putting up with us but doing it so graciously and uh, so she's good for that and we ought to be thankful. In the 80s there was the establishment of what's called the Westar Institute and that was the work of Robert W. Funk and that's what turned into the Jesus Seminar, gaining a full head of steam in the 90s. And it was sort of the spearhead of what was going on in academia, which basically had the notion that if you read the Bible, you really can't know the real Jesus. And in that group, there was a prejudice against what we have as the inspired Word of God. There was a prejudice against canonical books. There was uh, an affinity for non-canonical works of writing. And so they had prejudice against the Word of God in trying to understand who Jesus was. And basically, there was an underlying theological intention. And that is basically that since we can confuse you about who you think Jesus is according to the Word of God, then you can just make him whoever you want to be. That sort of took root in our modern era. And I guess maybe... Sort of the hallmark of that was Peter Jennings' search for Jesus in about 2000, putting that on. And now it's basically the idea that most people have when you say, who is Jesus? Well, you know, he's this guy. Well, what do you know about him? Seldom when you ask that question does somebody turn to a book, chapter, and verse and start saying, well, here's what I learned when I tried to decide who Jesus was when I examined the Bible. People don't treat that question that way. Instead, what they do is... They decide the person, kind of like an imaginary friend, who they would get along with the most. And then they interpret everything they read in the Bible through that lens, through that filter. And so when you ask somebody who is Jesus, you get all kinds of different answers, very few of which are biblical. One time, I was working with a guy and we had this exact conversation that came up. Well, you know, we were talking about religion and church and the guy was talking about that he didn't go to church and the reasons why and he started talking about his relationship with Jesus and so I asked him well who is Jesus what's he like and he said well you know if Jesus were here he'd say hey man slap me a high five and smoke a big fat J that's what this guy said for those of you who don't know that's drugs so this is this guy's idea of who Jesus was and it's basically the the common accepted pop culture view of Jesus is that he's who you would get along with. People don't tend to think about Jesus as being a guy who would, well, you know, tell them that they're wrong about anything because that's not a guy that we like to be around. And we know we'd like to be around Jesus because we made him up that way. People don't answer the question, who is Jesus, the appropriate way. Instead, he's just a buddy. I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 16 to begin with. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I guess it's important to understand what the common idea about Jesus is. 
And uh, the Lord brought that question up. They answered, verse 14, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, to others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. More important question, verse 15. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Now Peter answered correctly, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And of course, Jesus pronounced a blessing on him for giving the correct answer, one that he learned by examining what Jesus had done, examining the scriptures, understanding that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of prophecy. As you go on down, you're going to find a rebuke of Peter down in verse 22. Actually, Peter rebuking the Lord first, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Referring, of course, to the fact that Jesus was going to go to the cross and die as a sacrifice for our sins. Peter didn't want that. What this reveals is that while Peter understood certain things about the personage of Christ, understood certain things about the title of Christ, the Messiah, understood certain things about him fulfilling prophecy, he lacked understanding about his mission. He lacked understanding about Jesus' character. And these are important as well. A lot of people can give you an answer if you say, who is Jesus? They might say he's the Christ, Son, of the living God. And you say, well, Jesus, would, would he say that what you're doing right there, that thing that you're doing right there, would he say that's wrong? No, he wouldn't do that. He's my bud. We're going to hang out. They understand certain things, but they don't make true application in understanding his very character, his very nature, and what his mission was. We're going to talk more about Peter's rebuke in a little bit. You see there, as you get to verse 23... Jesus said, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. I advise you to go and listen to Gary Summers' lecture if you didn't, if you weren't here the other night, because it was good and it dealt with basically that, that uh, topic. But people understand certain things about Jesus, but they misunderstand some of the most important things about Christ and who he is, and therefore, being a Christian following after Christ, they misunderstand certain things about Christianity. Probably, the easiest way to deal with the topic at hand is not just say, well, look at Jesus confronting things, but more importantly, to look at, say, Jesus saying, here's how you ought to confront things if you're going to walk after me, if you're going to walk in my steps. And Jesus did that very thing. In Matthew chapter 5, in verse 22, Jesus taught it was wrong to be angry with a brother without cause. He didn't say it was wrong to be angry. He didn't say it was wrong to be angry with a brother. He said it was wrong to be angry with a brother without cause. Jesus himself was angry at times. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 5, uh, we understand that we're not to let the sun go down on our wrath. Be angry and sin not, Ephesians 4. Uh, so we understand that the anger wasn't the problem there. It was the lacking the cause. And he went on to elaborate on that and, and deal with it. And he was talking about, if you're going to go worship, you see there in verse 23, and you remember that your brother has ought against you. And I like to think about this sometimes because you realize that in our modern conception of what it means to have ought against somebody, that when Jesus was observing the Passover before his death, basically the whole nation of Israel had ought against him. It's not what he's talking about. It's talking about having a legitimate claim against you. Now, he tells them to leave your gift at the altar, go and reconcile to your brother, and so to make amends. But here's the thing. In our world today, to have that confrontation is considered wrong. In other words, let sleeping dogs lie. It's not an issue. The most important thing is that you go worship God. Don't worry about all those th other things. And Jesus' basic uh, point here is that you've got to deal with that issue. Now, in this case, uh, seemingly that it's the one who's, who's uh, charged with going and, and taking the action is the one who's actually in the wrong here. But the point is that you have to deal with those issues. And a Christianity that says that you don't deal with things is not found in the Bible. It's not after Jesus. And it doesn't follow his character at all. And go with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. This one's probably a little bit more to the point. Jesus taught about confrontation when the heir was on the part of the other party in personal matters. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Okay, if you stop right there, this is something that the Bible commands. 
Just let that sink in for a second. Understand what people think it means to be a Christian. You have an obligation to go and deal with the issue. If that was all that was said about it, this passage would still be controversial as people try to uh, follow their own brand of Christianity. You've got to go and deal with it. And then you go on further. He says, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee uh, one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Brethren, that's so mean. That's what we're told. You know, people say, well, certainly Jesus wouldn't expect me to do that. I mean, after all, this makes me uncomfortable, and Jesus would never want me to do something that makes me uncomfortable. Well, that's contrary to what you find in the Bible. Jesus expects many things of us that are uncomfortable. What does it mean to take up your cross? You think that Jesus going to the cross and calling us to be like him is all about comfort? Well, that's not what you find in the Scriptures. Jesus instructed his disciples about confronting one another. You know, you might find somebody who has a misconception of Jesus and they say, well, yeah, you know, I read the parts of the Bible, you know, like Matthew 23, where Jesus is telling them how the cow ate the cabbage, but he's not going to tell me to talk to my brother in that way. Why not? Jesus loved truth above anything else, and he instructed his disciples to confront error when they found it. Another thing that you find is that Jesus confronted his closest companions. You know, used to preaching away from here, I could get away with telling stories about people that I'd known and, you know, I could say names and things and I can't do that so much because somebody might have gone to school with the kid or known the person. So I kind of have to scale it back and change the names to protect the innocent or the guilty, whatever it may be. But I remember in fifth grade in Miss Ellis's class, there was one kid whose name shall not be named. And uh, this kid was the suck up. And, you know, he was always saying something sweet to Miss Ellis, and she would look at him when he was chewing gum, and uh, he got away with it. I don't know, you know, that, that didn't work out so well for me and Brady and John, because anytime we did anything, she had her eyes on us, because, well, we weren't like this other kid who I'm not going to name, but he got away with everything. And I think that some people think that the Lord is like that. They think, you know, I'm kind of his pet, I'm his good kid, and... I can kind of get away with what I want to because after all, I did this thing that was really nice and, you know, when I'm in church, I sing really loud and, uh, you know, sometimes I just get all choked up when I'm thinking about uh, Jesus. And so, you know, when I decide I want to go out and have a little sin, well, you know, Jesus, he's my buddy and we're going to get along and it's going to be okay. That same kind of thinking has infected the brotherhood too. And instead of having a brotherhood, what you end up with is what you refer to as a buddyhood. And buddy, that's not referring to you. That's something completely different. You have a buddyhood. And this has happened over and over again, but since about 2005, it's really affected brethren that were uh, previously faithful and strong, or so we seem to think. In fact, I had one preacher tell me regarding Curtis Kate's defense of false teachers, actually said, well, you know, it's really important that you look at all the good that he's done before you jump on that, because, you know, he's doing a lot of good. Well, brethren, that's a buddyhood. And you don't find Jesus practicing that kind of thing. And you don't find Jesus telling his disciples to follow that kind of living and that kind of dealing with error. Instead, he calls things out. And one thing you find as you read the New Testament is that Jesus was one that would call out his closest disciples. He would call them out. Sometimes, I, I mean, I trust in the providence and the way that, that we have the Bible, but sometimes I wish that the book of Mark were the first in the gospel accounts because if somebody sat down to read the book of Mark first, they would have a different picture of Jesus than if they had read these others. You know, Jesus calls out his disciples a lot in the book of Mark, and that's not where we're going with this. We're going to look at Luke chapter 9 in just a minute, but he does. And Jesus was one that was not hesitant to call out his disciples. I'd like to look at a few accounts in, in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And there's sort of a series of them there. We can start off with verse 41 and leading up to this. A man brought his child who was possessed to the disciples. And they couldn't cast out the devil. They couldn't cast out this demon. And when they brought the child to Jesus... The Lord said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? 
You know, that's not the kind of thing that you expect to hear uh, when you show up in front of Jesus. A faithless and perverse generation. We brought him to you. Isn't that a good thing? And after all, we've been hanging out with you. I gave up my job. I was a, had a lucrative fishing trade, and here I am with you. That's not the way that you treat me. You know, I'm the one that's, uh, uh, I volunteered to be here, Lord. Don't do me that way. And this had special application to the disciples later on in uh, Mark chapter 9 and Matthew 17. Jesus, when, their, when the disciples came to him, he explained to them their lack of faith and not being able to deal with the situation. You know, how come he didn't just scratch them behind the ear and say, well, you know, you gave it a good old try? Because that's not who Jesus was. This is what they needed in order to grow. This is what they needed in order to learn what it means to be faithful. Going on in, in Luke chapter 9, later on he, had, he admonished them for their uh, inability to understand the betrayal that was coming to him. Look with me, if you will, at verses 43 through 45. They were all amazed at the mighty power of God, but while they wondered every one at the things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears. Why do you think that he, that he underscored that? I mean, why didn't he just go ahead and tell them and move on? It's because he understood their inability to understand these things, and he wanted to highlight that. You know, you, you highlight people's weaknesses. I mean, that's not really the way that we deal with people, right? Uh, that's not compassionate. But that's what the Lord was doing here. Because without bringing attention to that, then they would never grow in their ability to understand things and change their, their way of listening to what he was saying and, and incorporating it into their understanding of who Christ was. So he says, Let not these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. They didn't get the picture, obviously. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them, that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Luke nine forty three through 45. Later on, there was the competition between the disciples. They want to know who was going to be the, the, the best. In verse 46, there rose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest, and Jesus perceiving the thought of their heart. Now, pause right here. In this account, it wasn't just that they walked up to him and said, you know, Lord, uh, I, I just want to be the best, and uh, I want to be disrespectful to my other brethren. That's not what happened here. And sometimes we're told that if you know a brother holds a false position, but he doesn't actually speak it, then you should leave him alone. And Jesus, understanding the thought of their hearts, called attention to their false concepts about what it meant to be a servant. The Lord brought that to the forefront. He highlighted the things that they said, and he highlighted the things that they didn't say also. He brought that up. Look at what he says. Took a child and set, by, set him by him. And said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you, the same shall be great. Now a lot of people point to this and they say, Well, look at the tact and the wisdom Jesus used in reproving their error. Okay, I can understand that. But I want you to stop and think for a second. Were the disciples made to feel uncomfortable because of things that they thought? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Jesus wasn't one who was shying away from confronting his disciples. Unspoken error is still error and must be dealt with. As you go on, he dealt with their improperly formed exclusivity. You see that uh, John said to the Lord that they saw one casting out devils in his name and they forbade him because he didn't follow with them. In other words, he's doing this. He's doing it. I mean, who else's authority are you going to cast out devils by? He's doing it by the Lord's authority. But he's not hanging out with us, so, you know, he's not a, a class A disciple, and so I just let him have it. Well, the Lord told them that that was wrong, and he dealt with us, uh, dealt with him on, that, on those grounds. Later on, the final confrontation in the chapter, Luke chapter 9, verses 55 and 56, uh, actually beginning just a little bit above there, James and John offered to call down fire from heaven to consume the inhospitable Samaritans. You've got to think about this from their perspective. After all, they had biblical precedent, uh, precedent from 2 Kings chapter 1. I mean, that's what Elijah had done. So, you know, this seems like a good idea. They've probably been waiting to use that trick for a while now, just waiting for somebody to show up and uh, not treat the Lord the way they wanted to so they could snap some fire down. But the Lord told them, the Lord told them that this was the incorrect response to the situation. 
And the problem was they didn't understand his mission. Luke 19 and verse 10 was to come and seek and save that which was lost. You see there in verses 55 and verses 56, notice what he does. Ye know not what manner of spirit you're of. You know what he just did there? He said, boys, you're ignorant. That's not very kind in dealing with the disciples. Oh, but you know, I mean, they left their jobs and they're out there and they're being abused by all these other people. You should have a little bit more compassion on them, Lord. This isn't the way that, uh, uh, you know, modern books on evangelism tell us to treat your, your volunteers. You're going to run them off. But the Lord did. He brought up their air and he dealt with it. He said, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went into another village. Luke chapter 9, verses 55 through 56. This becomes much more interesting when you think about the fact that uh, it was John that went down to Samaria and prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit and laid hands upon those Samaritans over in Acts chapter 8. Sometimes it's important to remember the long game in things. You might think, well, you know, what good is it going to do to tell off this brother? Tell off is not really what's going on there. I just use that term loosely. But what good is it going to do? It's going to make me uncomfortable. It's going to make him uncomfortable. It's going to push him away from trying to serve. But you've got to think about the long game. Do you think that uh, Peter and John would be where they were in Acts chapter 8 in terms of growth if they hadn't endured what the Lord told them in Luke chapter 9? You can speculate all you want, but uh, I'm inclined to think no. They wouldn't. This was needful for them. Over in Mark chapter 8, again referring to Peter and the rebuke that he received from the Lord when he told him not to go to the cross, basically. Notice what you have in verse 33 of Mark chapter 8. When he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Now, first off, Jesus Christ engaged in name-calling. And it's not just those guys over there. Of his closest companions, he referred to him as Satan. Now, that's not nice. We're told that you're not supposed to engage in name-calling, but that's what the Lord did. Another thing that he did that's probably uh, causes a little bit more stir among people than just calling somebody a name is that he called his motives and his affections into question. Thou savorest not the things of God. You know, you can't question somebody's motives. You can't question somebody's intentions. If they say something stupid, there's a problem. Okay? And if you're upset about me using the word stupid, then I just refer you to uh, Jeremiah 4.22. Somewhere around there, the Bible uses that term as well. Peter's affections were called into question. Peter was certainly a sincere man. But he was sincerely wrong, and he needed to be called out on this matter. He didn't appreciate the things of God. He wanted the things of men when he was trying to tell the Lord not that this shouldn't happen to him. Sometimes people get all upset about things in, in the church and the way that the Lord outlined for the church to approach him in various ways in, in worship and service, for instance, uh, in terms of instrumental music. Can you imagine uh, some brother coming up and saying, well, you know, I understand that singing is good, but uh, don't you think we could get into it more if we had a piano over there? Well, maybe we could get into it more in a certain sense, but it wouldn't bring us closer to God. It wouldn't be pleasing to Him. But can you imagine if we told them that, you know, you don't appreciate the things of God, but of men. You know, usually we want to sit down and have a Bible study with that person, study authority with them, and that's good, and that's right. But imagine if your, your first response to that kind of topic was, well, you just don't love the things of God. That's what the Lord did to Peter on this particular occasion. That's the way that he dealt with the issue. And sometimes it seems that, uh, you, you know, you try to think of the best way to do things, and there's so much talk about the best way to do things. What would it help us to try to approach these situations more like Jesus did? I mean, is that a noble endeavor? Because this is what the Lord did. His response was, you don't love the things of God. If that was the first thing that came to you when somebody brought up this, this issue, uh, then would we be better off? You know, it's, it's good to think about the best way to do things, but uh, at least that's on the table, isn't it? Because in most congregations, that's not even a topic uh, uh, that's willing to be spoken about. You don't say things like that as far as most people are concerned. 
In Mark chapter 4, we've got another incident. And this is actually is one of my favorites. Mark chapter 4. The disciples in a boat crossing the sea. Vicious storm came. The boat started taking on water. Not a good sign. Verse 38, the disciples woke Christ who was sleeping in the boat. And their charge to him was that he didn't care. And they made an assumption, we're perishing. Those were two problems, two problems there. And first off, you know, they weren't perishing. The Lord knew that. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't be asleep. And he still had work to do. So they weren't going to perish. That was a lack of their faith. But also, the fact that they thought he didn't care, they charged him with that. He called them out for being fearful and lacking faith in verse 40. But they assumed that his behavior indicated a lack of concern. And this happens a lot of times. Some brother comes to you and they say, you know, they have this issue on their mind. And they say, you're not as upset about this as I am. And therefore, you don't care. Imagine if you told them, well, you know, the sky is not falling and you don't have enough faith. If that was the way that you dealt with, uh, you know, the good brethren in the congregation when they had this issue and they were all discombobulated about something and were about to fall apart and you didn't get as upset about it as they did. And you said, you just don't have enough faith. That's what the Lord did to these disciples when they came to him with this issue. They were wrong about that also. You know, sometimes I hadn't done this in a while because obviously I don't have to the same here because, you know, we have good elders and. David deals with a lot of things from the pulpit, but people would come to me with things, and I'd give them homework assignments. Say, I understand you're all upset about this, but here's this homework assignment for you. Philippians 4, 6 through 8, and you go read that and then come back, and then we'll discuss your issue. Sometimes that's the way that I deal with things. But nonetheless, they had a lack of faith. The Lord was one who was willing to confront his closest disciples. Another thing is that the Lord was one who was willing to confront individuals. I had a, one elder. Actually, there were two elders in one congregation. One elder in this congregation told me, you know, you can say things much more harshly and directly from the pulpit than you can in personal conversation. You know, and that's appropriate. Another elder, same congregation, told me, well, you know, when you're dealing with people one-on-one, -on -one, you can get a lot more direct. But when you're in the pulpit, you've got to be a lot more gentle. You know, I don't know what to believe sometimes. <laughs> but this was these two elders, same congregation, and this is what they told me. We saw how Jesus confronted his disciples, but Jesus, on an individual basis, dealt with things also. He wasn't going to say, well, you know, I'm here, it's a one-on-one -on -one personal situation, so I'm not going to rock the boat, so to speak. I guess the boat had already been rocked over in Mark chapter 4, but nonetheless, this is what he did. Look with me, if you will, at John chapter 4. And a lot of times people like to think about John chapter 4 for examples of compassion and examples of evangelism. And I understand that it, it certainly does uh, that in, in both of those areas, serves as an example. But how it is, sometimes I wonder if they're reading the same account of John chapter 4 that I am. They're filtering it through that lens of who they want Jesus to be rather than what the text actually says. On terms of compassion, of course, the Lord was one who was willing to go into Samaria. They were human beings. They were created by God. And uh, so he was willing to go through there. That was fine. And certainly that introduces the topic of compassion there. But there he is at the well in Samaria. And this woman, the Samaritan woman, comes out to draw water. And uh, it's not a rebuke per se, but he tells her to draw water for him. One time I was thinking about... Uh, evangelism and methods of evangelism and reading books that talk about methods of evangelism and I sat down and turned to John chapter 4 and started saying you know what does the Lord do and uh, I thought maybe I'd write a book on on soul winning and uh, I thought you know a good title of that you know the Lord said go get me some water I thought a good title for that if this is Jesus's method is asking people to do things for you then maybe we should make a book that says go make me a sandwich I wonder if that would sell sometimes, you know, if this was your method of evangelism, if people would call you out to host soul winning workshops and things such as that, if that was your method. But nonetheless, that's what Jesus did. He told her to get him some water. I can just hear the feminist. I'm not going to start on that. <laughs> but as he's going through these things, he, he starts this conversation and offers her the living water. And 
as a condition when she says, okay, and I always like hearing David preach on this passage because it always points out this woman had to go out to the well every day and get the water. She wanted to not go anymore. So this water where she wouldn't have to go and draw it every day, uh, that was a good idea to her. So she asks for it, and the Lord places a condition on her. He says, you go get your husband and come back, and then we'll talk. And of course, the topic came up for marriages and divorces in our current state of fornication. Now, you know, people would gasp if you're in a situation where you're trying to talk to somebody and teach them the gospel, evangelizing, and, and this came up, people would probably gasp. But when you stop to think about the fact that the Lord knew her situation before he brought that up, you know, I can just imagine the elders' meetings, if you, if you got caught doing that, they'd say, you knew about it? You know what people would call that? They would call that being a smart aleck. That's what people would say. You're just being a smart aleck. You didn't have to bring that up. Well, maybe I didn't, but the Lord did here, didn't he? And if he did it, why can't I do it? I mean, after all, do you think that he's an example or should I go get a different one because you don't like him? This is what the Lord did. He brought up the, the condition of her marriage. He brought up her immorality. He introduced that topic. You think that she was comfortable with that? I don't think so. This made her very uncomfortable, and that's what she needed. So the Lord brought that up. Well, she changed the topic of discussion rather rapidly. In verse 19, she saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Okay, what, what was your first clue there? But uh, anyways, so she talks to him about this issue, and she brings up another controversial issue. This time it was her. She brings up what some people might call the worship wars. You know, y'all worship in that mountain. We worship in this mountain because we're Samaritans. And uh, which one's the right one? And you know the way the Lord deals with that? He says, well, it's irrelevant. That's confrontational by itself. People tell us, you have to be sensitive to things that people are concerned about. Otherwise, you're not a sensitive person. And Jesus wants you to be sensitive and, and all these things. And so telling somebody when they come to you with an issue, telling them it's irrelevant is very unkind. You're not supposed to do that. You're not going to win souls doing that. But that's what the Lord did, isn't it? That was controversial and confrontational. Second thing he told her is you're ignorant. You know, people say, well, you know, I went to a church of Christ and uh, they told me I didn't have to be baptized. Well, what if your response to that was, well, you're just ignorant. You know, if that was the way that you dealt with it to cause them to think about what the Bible actually says rather than what this person said and that person said, if that's the way you dealt with it, how would brethren treat you if this was the way that you dealt with things? It's interesting this is the way the Lord dealt with things. And we know how people treated him. They put him on the cross. Jesus Christ was a very confrontational individual in doing all of these things. And he instructed her on proper worship. Well, then she brings up the issue of authority. And she did it on her own. And she did what people do. Well, yeah, there's authority in what you say. But I'm going to go and look for another source. I'm going to wait for a future Messiah. That was her answer. Of course, Jesus kind of pulled the rug out from under there. Well, yeah, I'm him, so you better just take it. She learned, finally, after going through all these things, you know, we're told that you're not supposed to draw a line in the sand on authority, but isn't that exactly what Jesus did here? Authority was the real issue. And if she wouldn't respect his authority, then she had nothing to gain from anyone, anywhere, anytime. People listen, you show them what the Bible says, and they say, well, you know, I'm going to have to go ask my pastor. Fine, go ask your pastor. And if he's not in agreement with the Bible, he's wrong. Because the Bible's right. And if you don't do only what's authorized by the Bible, then you're going to be wrong. That's the way that Jesus dealt with individuals on an individual basis. I've got to skip ahead, but... Jesus Christ also confronted the masses. You know, people read the Sermon on the Mount and they think that's the sweet, syrupy thing. And uh, again, I think, what Sermon on the Mount are they reading? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 refers to the people who were listening to that as his disciples. And he goes through there and he talks about blessed are the poor in spirit. And you understand just uh, from a cursory reading of, of the Bible that the Jews were anything but poor in spirit. They were anything but meek. And they didn't believe that this was the way that the Messiah would bring about the kingdom. They had misconceptions on all accounts concerning those things. And when somebody would hear that as a Jew with all of their modern misconceptions, you know, this would make them a little bit uncomfortable was confronting their views 
on the way that they were supposed to be. You go on through that and you see the, uh, the list of errors and he challenged them to turn from the errors of the Pharisees and the scribes, which is one of the ways, Matthew 5 verse 20, one of the ways that you know that his hearers were not necessarily the same as the scribes and the Pharisees. Maybe there were some among them, but uh, he's dealing with them as disciples. And he goes through and what I call basically a laundry list of their false teachings, he confronts the basic doctrines that most people believed at the time to some degree or another. <laughs> Their doctrines on hatred, Matthew 5, verse 21 through 26. Here's a big one. You know, you're not supposed to push the hot buttons, right? That's what you're not supposed to do. Otherwise, you're being contra uh, controversial and confrontational and, you know, you're contentious for the faith. That's what people are telling you. But Jesus brought up divorce and adultery. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 32, he brought up their uh, honesty in Matthew 5, 33 through 37, their sense of justice, really their sense of vengeance, Matthew 5, 38 through 42, uh, and, and so on and so forth, contrasting the people, what they should be doing with what the scribes and the Pharisees should be doing. Well, those were confrontational things calling into question the, the, the things that people were doing at the time. Matthew chapter 7 Verses 1 and 2, probably one of the most well-known passages in the Bible about judging. Understand John 7 verse 24 teaches to judge the righteous judgment. But following that, he tells them that some people are to be discerned as being swine and dogs. That's more name-calling. That's what Jesus did. But can you imagine telling somebody, well, I'm no longer going to study the Bible with you. And they say, why? Say, well, you know, when I read my Bible and I compare what you're doing and what you're saying to what the Bible teaches me, it tells me that you're a swine or a dog. Now, I'm not advising you to go out and do that. That shouldn't be exactly what you do. But I'm saying this is in the Bible for a reason. It's a command to be followed. It's a command to be obeyed. In other words, to follow these things, to discern that, Matthew 7, verse 6, and then act accordingly. Well, that's confrontational. You go on and you see that Jesus was against false prophets and, you know, I, I've come to learn that, you know, you can get up and you can write articles and you can preach and you can say, stay away from false teachers and they're mean and horrible and they want to take your soul and you can do all that. But if you write an article saying there exists such a thing as a false teacher, people don't like to deal with that. They like to be dismissive as long as you're talking about the way you're supposed to treat false teachers. But if you tell them, you'd better realize that there is such a thing, that's application. And if there's one thing that people hate, it's application. Trust me. Jesus confronted the masses on several, several items. I don't have time to go with all of the things that I prepared. Uh, is my time's running short, gone, close? Oh, we got three and a half minutes. We can cram in a bunch of stuff. Um, but I advise you to read the book and go and look and see what else is in there. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to get to was over in Matthew chapter 8, and uh, excuse me, John chapter 8, and I'll just go ahead and, and skip over to that. John chapter 8, verse 31. You know the account leading up in John chapter 6, he had fed the multitudes, they followed him, and John chapter 8, he preaches a sermon basically similar to the one that he started in John chapter 6 after telling them, don't follow me for the food. Can you imagine going and standing outside of a soup kitchen and saying, your motives are wrong, you're going to be lost. Even if they feed you, they're going to be lost for not telling you that you're wrong. Imagine doing that. That's the pattern that Jesus showed in John chapter 6. But he's going through and he tells them, I'm the bread. You know, they wanted him to feed them with manna. The real reason is they wanted uh, a chicken in every pot, so to speak. The, revealing their intentions with that term evermore. Uh, talking about the manna, give us this bread evermore. And uh, he told them that was wrong too and he was the bread of life. But he went on preaching. And you see that finally some of them started to believe in verse 30 of John chapter 8. He spake these words, many believed on him. We're told, okay, you got them where you want them. You know, you get somebody and they're in favorable disposition. You know, maybe somebody says, okay, we've got them baptized. Now be really sweet to them so they don't leave. I'm saying no, tell them what they need to hear so they won't ever fall away. Because there's a difference in the two. But Jesus said to those Jews, notice, which believed on him, if ye continue on my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, shall make you free. You know, 
After this, they turned away. You can't say Jesus is the authority. You know, Jesus, they liked you. Why couldn't you have just left it at that? They were happy with you. They were going along with you. Y'all were enjoying bread together. Everything was fine and dandy. Jesus said, it's not enough. You've got to confront people even when things are going well. Otherwise, they're going to fall away. It's about being right with God. It's not about making people comfortable. It's not about having your buddyhood. It's not about having nice situations. It's about being right with God and getting to heaven. That's what it's about. The big difference, ultimately, is whether or not we will receive correction. And I know something. I know that if Jesus were here right now, he would tell me how I could walk more closely with him. He would tell me how I could live up to his example better. I've all got room for improvement. Everybody does. And as he's telling me those things, might not be comfortable, but it'd be what I need. That's why I read his words in the Bible. Why do you? Thank you, Jeff, for that fine lesson. That's um, it's always hard for me to understand. Uh, I know that the Lord loved those men, those it was not a, the, the disciples and all men. He loved all men and, and their, had concern for their souls and where their eternal destination might be. And uh, as he was correcting them, it's certainly, uh, you can see the ones that had an interest in eternal life of, uh, in, in heaven and those who didn't. And it's certainly something uh, we all face today. I know the elders do. When you, it's, when you go and talk to somebody about a problem they're having, the, the, the first thing they do is they're going to bow up their back. It's just human nature, and um, it takes a, a, a strong person who uh, has a will to want to go to heaven to say, you know, maybe I need to look at this and, uh, and study through it. And, uh, but uh, like you said, Jesus had no problem telling us, well, and he did that because he loved them. He loved their souls. Appreciate the lesson so much. We stand adjourned until the top of the hour. Don't forget, I think there's uh, refreshments between uh, uh, the uh, lectures here and certainly... Uh, uh, be sure and go through the book's uh, displays, and we'll see you at the top of the hour.